Hi, and welcome to another edition of Studio 411. I'm your host, Larry De Silva. Uh, we've got a real treat for you today. We've got someone who is uh, multi-talented, uh, as I, I think a lot of our guests are that come on Studio 411. Uh, Denise Nicholas, you say, oh, I know that name from somewhere, and uh, you might have even seen her recently on TV, uh, if not uh, through her uh, literary works, which we're going to talk about. Uh, Denise Nicholas, uh, an American uh, actress, social activist, uh, again, involved in the Civil rights movement as a uh, young woman back in the mid 60s. Uh, you probably know her best for uh, a couple of TV series uh, that uh, were uh, long running in their own rights. Uh, she played um, uh, counselor Liz McIntyre on the uh, uh, very uh, uh, classic, to say the least. Uh, uh, sitcom. I guess it was a sitcom. It was more kind of a comedy drama back in those days. Yes. Room 222. Yes. She's answering me and I haven't even introduced her. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then, of course, played Councilwoman Harriet DeLong on the uh, long-running TV series based on the film In the Heat of the Night, co-starring Carol O'Connor. Uh, uh, Denise Nicholas, welcome to the program. I appreciate you joining us. Thank you, Larry. Happy to be here. Thank you. And uh, again, we're featuring here a, a piece of work, uh, to say the least, in a positive way uh, uh, in her career. Uh, Denise has uh, become uh, multi-talented, uh, gone back, gotten uh, furthered her education, which probably interrupted back in those days of the 60s, and also uh, has written a book uh, that uh, is uh, in its uh, uh, my goodness, multiple printings at this point. Uh, actually, we're looking at an image of the uh, audio book, a book called Freshwater Road. Uh, Denise also has garnered three Golden Globe nominations for Outstanding Lead Actress in a Drama Series for Room 222, as well as three NAACP Image Awards. And she's also the recipient of, a recipient rather, of two local uh, Los Angeles Emmys for producing and narrating the 1981 uh, PBS uh, special uh, voices of my people in celebration of black poetry. So you have not only um, uh, stepped in front of the camera, uh, behind the camera, and also pen to camera. So uh, uh, how, how does that feel? Uh, quite a bit of achievement in your uh, relatively short life. You're so kind. I love it. Thank you. Uh, she was only three. She was like Rose Marie. She was only three when she started. Actually, here's a baby picture of her now. I think this was during your days when you were with uh, one of those uh, theater companies that you uh, were first with, probably uh, the one that wound, took you to uh, New York, correct? Uh, the Negro Ensemble Company. Yes, absolutely. So now tell me, uh, uh, how does one, uh, uh, we'll, we'll focus on the book for the first part of the, the program. Uh, the book in itself, again, has been been called uh, many things. Uh, uh, Janet Fitch, uh, author of White Oleander, called it uh, uh, that you brought alive all the colors and emotions of the civil rights movement during the perilous adventure that was Freedom Summer. Again, high praise and so many more. There's one here by the Washington Post when the book came out. Surely the best work of fiction about the civil rights movement since the autobiography of Miss Jane. Pittman, which was written by yeah. Ernest J. Gaines. So uh, just a tremendous amount of praise and, uh, again, uh, pretty pretty heavy stuff to uh, digest back uh, a few years ago. Mm -hmm. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it still makes me blush. Um, I don't know. I think, you know, I really think from way, way, way back from high school, say, let's say high school, my closet dream was to be a writer. It was never to be an actor. But the acting uh, plank just took off. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Was, yeah. You know, it took off because it's, it's a completely different Now, according uh, to my source, According to my sources, now you were born in Michigan, or is that? But I've I've seen where others claim differently. So uh, clear no, clear I'm, that I'm up for Detroit. us. In, born in Detroit, Michigan, and again, uh, mm -hmm. um, we have an image later on that even at the young age of 16, you appeared uh, uh, in 1960 on the cover of Jet magazine as a future teacher prospect. So was that I, was that what they were grooming you for? Was to go into education? Well, I you know I think that. Girls who were, who had good grades and looked like they had some potential were kind of always, tried, you know, people tried to always kind of push you into education or less um, 40, 40 occupations. I think um, 
it was just, I think that was just the way people thought at that time, but it was never really my goal to teach school. Uh, I thought about going to law school. I thought about, my, my dad wanted me to go to medical school. But I, you know, I could barely pass chemistry, so that wasn't going to happen. That's yeah, a little <laughs> tough. A little. T <laughs> I wasn't one of my favorite subjects either, so to never fear. Yeah, I see. Yeah, you went to you enrolled at the University of Michigan as a pre-law yeah. major, and then you uh, switched to Latin American politics. Was that during the, uh, the during the Castro regime? Uh, perhaps that might have influenced you a little bit. You know, it may well have because I had a cousin who was teaching. Uh, at the University of Puerto Rico in Rio Piedra, and we visited him in Puerto Rico, and the Cuban thing was, like, happening. So he was giving me stuff to read, and I was reading things about, you know, about Latin American politics that I never knew, and I was taking a lot of Spanish. Well, this was later, I was taking Spanish class at U of M, so it was, I was definitely always interested in politics. Um, not in the sense of going to the civil rights at that point, but in politics, kind of a general, uh, a general theme, a general aspect of life that was attracted to. Um, thank God I didn't do that. So, yeah. Now I notice in the in the book, uh, uh, Freshwater Road. Again, it's fiction, but yet it seems to parallel your life. Again, the the main character is Celeste Tyree. Again, mm -hmm. University of Michigan sophomore, trans uh, travels to Mississippi. So it really, it's mm -hmm. kind of like almost uh, memoir like, but yet it's it's cloaked under under a, a set of fictitious characters. Yes, absolutely. It is uh, certainly inspired by my journey in the South. It is reflective of of some of that, but most mostly it is a work of fiction. And but I, it's it's fiction that it tries to prove to the historical period that it's talking about. It tries to uh, to treat the events of that period very carefully, with uh, great attention to the detail, no exaggeration or minimization just this is what happened you know and then the writing is in a literary style so it's a combination of memoir and fiction now, in the book, the character Celeste travels down to the South, uh, Mississippi, of course, to help uh, blacks register to vote or help the process. I found it interesting <laughs> that 50-some uh, uh, years later, 50-plus years later, that we, we seem to still have issues with folks being given the, uh, the uh, uh, as they would say, God-given right to, uh, to vote, or, or am I misunderstanding something with, with current politics these days? I don't get it. We're going backwards. Uh, it's driving me crazy. We're yeah, going backwards. Yeah. I mean, you've got to... And, and not just in voting rights. We're going backwards on a lot of things. And I'm just sitting here shaking my head going, what in the world? <laughs> yeah. Why are we doing this? Why are we going backwards with I'm, with so many things? I don't know. We don't want to get into the nitty-gritty of it because it's on the news every day. But, um, yeah, I see it. And it, it's very... Uh, it's troubling. It's disconcerting, and it's kind of, it makes me a little bit afraid for the country, absolutely. Actress Denise Nicholas, as in Saint Nicholas, which uh, we, she actually should have called herself Saint Nicholas. I'm surprised an agent didn't uh, didn't tell her to do that. Uh, for, uh, jo joining us here for the hour on Studio 411, the book here to my left, Freshwater Road, a novel. Again, uh, it's uh, undergone a few different uh, incarnations as far as the cover. This, I believe, is the latest cover. Uh, again, uh, you also had a 10th anniversary edition, which uh, uh, was very very wise on the part of the. Uh, Publisher. By the way, just for my uh, and the, the viewer's benefit, uh, uh, the publisher, uh, I have it as one. I want to make sure who's the publisher at this point. Uh, the publisher is Agate. Agate. In Evanston, Illinois. Okay. And the publisher is Doug Seibel. Gotcha. Very good. Very good. Mm -hmm. And uh, now going back to uh, to Denise in real time, I know uh, apparently your uh, your mom and dad. I, I got the feeling maybe more your dad than your mom thought that uh, you have lo had lost your mind when you decided to uh, forego what what uh, the plan was per se and and head down to Mississippi. I'm sure that went over very well. It was quite a catastrophe in my family. <laughs> and you know, when you read about other people who volunteered in the civil rights movement, uh, kids from all over the country, all the universities in the country were down there, white and black kids, and 
pretty much they all went through the same thing with their families because it was dangerous because you know your parents are, are looking at you saying well what do you have to do with that that that's the problem of the people who live there you don't have any say in that issue you know it's up to them to fight for their own rights what are you doing going down there putting yourself in harm's way and that was you know that was what parents were saying to kids all over the place um, but we went we went anyway and I, I wouldn't exchange that experience for anything. It, as dangerous and horrible as some of it was, it was uh, it was profound. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now uh, your your acting debut again. Uh, uh, you were you were at one point in time studying uh, Latin American politics. So I'm assuming that you were had perhaps even as far back as high school you had taken some Spanish courses or language. You you I get the impression you definitely uh, were somewhat fluent in the language. And your acting debut actually was in a Spanish language play. Yes. And then, uh, so what happened there? Was that when the bug hit you, or you were still kind of, ah, I'm just doing this, just to, kind of like a high school kid would do in their own high school plays? It, that's basically what that was. I also did a play in high school. I can't even remember the name of it. And then when I got to University of Michigan and started taking Spanish class, they, the, the professors uh, thought that I was getting the language so well and so quickly. They said, well, why don't you read what play? We're going to do a play with Arca Sin Testador by Alejandro Casona. So I said, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> so I did the play. I could not tell you what it was about. I think my accent was better than my comprehension. <laughs> <laughs> now, in your professional career, have you ever played someone who then had to use the, the language, uh, uh, you know, uh, or, or might have even you know, been quote unquote a, a uh, mixed race, Spanish, African American character. Has that ever come up oh. in, in the uh, acting career or the, during the, the no. last 40 years? No, no, interesting. That was I have to it. I have to tell you too because I meant to actually lead off the program with this uh, and and just because I think sometimes we all whether whether someone is you know a, a plumber or an actress or a business person I think it's always good to get some sort of uh, uh, positive reinforcement uh, I know yesterday I had a meeting with an individual who happened to just in conversation saying I was I was taping this program today and I said who the mm. guest was and and I had meant to tell you before but I said oh, let me save it for the the show a couple of other people as we got ready to do this episode who who just like were just oh my god their their body just jerked back like you are kidding me you're having her oh my god she is like she and I'll, I'll tell you the way I feel in a lot of these these folks and and ethnicity uh, is not not a factor here this was all across the board you were like to us uh, and, and my generation you were like the our version of Lena Horn okay in terms of beauty you know talent again I'll let you decide who was more talented you or Lena I think it's a close call but again just Thanks. just so you were aware of, of not only your impact in your television acting, I would say more so because most of us knew you more from mm -hmm. TV than movies. Uh, although yes. we did love you in Blackula. I know that's not, a, <laughs> that's not one, of the, one of your favorite roles, but again, kind of a cult classic. But I just wanted to get that out there that you really you. Uh, have had an impact that uh, men, especially uh, women too, and they said, oh my gosh, such a beautiful woman. But when I told guys, yeah. Uh, from let's say 40 to 60 and they were all like oh my goodness they were if I could have had an audience and had you here they would have been here and they would have been really so but to, not, not to spend the rest yeah. of the hour on this Thanks. but it was it was quite something else we even have a shot of you back in the day probably late 60s again uh, mm -hmm. uh, she'll say oh I remember that shot damn I do look good so <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anyway, back to uh, back to what led to uh, not only the career, but then all that came with it. Uh, how did you get involved with the uh, Free Southern Theater, uh, otherwise known as the FST? Yeah. Well, that was my work in the Civil Rights Movement, which uh, doesn't is not mirrored in the character in Freshwater Road. Uh, I worked in a theater group that was a part of SNCC. Uh, we traveled all over Mississippi and Louisiana presenting pra uh, plays to the community, primarily people who had never seen a play, many of whom had not no television, and most of whom had not seen a movie. So it was it was pretty rough. Uh, we performed mostly in churches, um, and we were just kind of a, 
an artistic or creative arm over the Free Southern Theater in Mississippi and Louisiana. So it was fantastic. It was hard, it was dangerous, and it was wonderful. Wonderful, absolutely. We talked a little before about how, you know, sometimes the more things change, the more they remain the same. I can remember this, and it, it's not something uh, to be proud of for all of us as, as citizens. But again, I can remember mm -hmm. back in the 80s, you know, we used to have a uh, kind of a saying up here that, you know, you'd look at statistics. This was when USA Today first came out in the early 80s, and it was usually, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it was something that was a category that reflected the, the uh, uh, necessarily bad situation in a given state. Mississippi was always mm -hmm. near the bottom and then if it was something you know I'm saying and vice versa and and in some ways I mean I, I can only imagine uh, uh, it's unfortunate maybe you have them if you do I would say you certainly have a, a photo book uh, in your future but uh, to see what I saw I know uh, watching TV and being pretty pretty even as a young mm -hmm. kid active with reading papers to see what has gone on or goes on and continues to go on in that state it, it's just like uh, it's 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 almost like going back in time i think in some cases yes it is it's, it, it felt like that when i went back out to do some research for freshwater road uh, i went into a part of mississippi that i really hadn't been in when i was there for the civil rights movement so it was i was trying to create an environment that was fresh to me new to me as well as to the reader so I stayed away in that book. I stayed away from the Delta. I stayed away from the things that the, the things that we all think of stereotypically when we think about Mississippi to try to find uh, something uh, that was just new, something that people didn't know because I didn't know it either. I had to discover it. So, but it's that trip down there to do research was just about as scary as it Yeah, it's, uh, that, and that, and that has come across not only in your book, but again, just from things over the years. It's just that, you know, mm -hmm. that you would think things would improve. And yeah, okay, we have cell phone, we have, uh, you know, uh, all this technology, whatever, but there's still a segment of, of people, not just in Mississippi, but throughout this country and the world, for yeah. that matter, that, that are, don't have that. You mentioned, too, about doing plays, whether it was with the... Um, uh, free Southern Theater, as well as some work mm -hmm. you did when you were in New York. I'll be honest with you, I've never been to Broadway myself, so you know, you would think someone who was like an hour or two hours away would have had that experience, but again, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and in those days, it might have been location-wise. Now I think it's more monetary-wise that there, there's yeah. a, a large segment of people that still are isolated from, from the arts. And uh, we as a yes, country can't seem true. to make up our mind, do we want to fund the arts or do we want to defund the arts? And, and I think, you know, anyone with a clear, clear uh, head will, will certainly uh, agree that you want to uh, fund the arts as much as possible on all levels. I don't know. I don't know to this day and I don't understand what the resistance is to that in this country. It's, uh, you know, you go to Europe and other places in the world and the arts are uh, protected and encouraged uh, when I see what's happening, for example, what's, what's happening in the Middle East when they're blowing up antiquity. It's, it's like, how, how does this happen? How do you destroy your own culture? How do you not save it and, go and put it out there and build on it? I mean, it, it's civilization. That's, that's what the arts are. I mean, it's it's for everyone. If there's anything in the world that's for everyone, it's the art. Absolutely. Uh, then from your experience uh, down in the South, you wound up uh, going to uh, New York City and uh, joined the Negro Ensemble Company. And uh, uh, tell me a little bit, uh, must have been a, a furthering uh, positive experience in your career. It was, it was terrific. First of all, I was brought to New York uh, by Vivica Limpour, the actress. Uh, she saw a East at uh, CBS did a show called Look Up and Live, and they came down south and did a, a segment on our theater. And she saw that in New York, and she reached out to me and asked to come up, uh, because she, she and her husband, George Tabori, were doing a play called Three Boards and a Passion. And it was excerpts from different, um, different years of theater, starting with, I think we started with Shakespeare, I can't remember. So I did that with Harris Ulan, Vivica Lynn Flores, and Roscoe Orman. And we toured, we did a college tour, so that was my introduction to New York theater. And it was great. I just, I felt like I just keep falling in the high cotton. <laughs> it was 
I'm doing great. That's so right. when that closed, we came back. We came back to New York, and I was uh, then I went into V and Rock off Broadway. Um, and then when that closed, I was on unemployment, taking my acting classes and my dance classes and all of that. And then I auditioned for the new song Alpha. Now at that, that started. at that that's point in time, or or let me say, uh, fast forward years later, uh, mm -hmm. any reason other than the fact that you're so busy out there on on the, the West Coast uh, that you never came back to do uh, th uh, theater again on Broadway itself, or was it just the kind of thing where just you know you you just went off in a different direction and never came back? Well, the plan was, when I first started doing Room 22, the plan was to go back to New York because we always have a hiatus television. It's a big chunk of time, and I thought, well, I can go back to the store and still work in the theater, but it just, it started to, the whole, the whole television experience started to pretty much take over my life because it wasn't just working for the six months or seven months that you filmed. There were promotional tours, and there were guest stops on other things, so it just, so it had a head of steam, and I just went with it. Sure. Yeah, I noticed back then, I don't know if I see it as much now, and I was even impressed <laughs> with, with your resume, was that you did an awful lot even during the period between 69 and 74. You, you guest starred on other shows, even on other networks, which was pretty yeah. impressive because yeah. in those days, you know, the three main networks, you know, were, were kind of hesitant to allow that, perhaps unless it was by the same studio that was producing a show. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I was I was. Surprised. I, I noticed that even with one of your co-stars, uh, Michael Constantine, I can remember him being on a few shows while he was mm -hmm. on Room 222. And, and Karen, and Karen did a lot of work too. So we were all working a lot. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, she was kind of the young ingenue. She kind of was a fresh face. I remember her being like one of the gidgets, and you know, kind of she was yeah. just being way in demand and stuff. And and now, correct me if I'm wrong. Did she not leave the show before the series ended, or am I mistaken? No, she stayed to the end. She did, okay. I don't know why I thought mm -hmm. she might have left during the last year. Uh, we're looking at a photo here of uh, uh, Denise Nicholas along with uh, uh, her castmate Lloyd Haynes. Uh, tell me a little bit about Lloyd. I, I know that uh, I enjoyed him very much on that show, and it just seemed like that after that show ended, except perhaps for maybe one other show that he might have been on, really didn't see a lot of him over the years. Uh, you know, uh, I know he's passed on, I believe. Uh, tell me a yeah. little bit about your your castmate for the all those years well we well first of all we had uh, we had a great great time we had good relationships Karen uh, the whole group Michael Lloyd Karen and myself and even some of the young you know the ones who were playing the students we had a lot of fun we worked hard but we supported each other and we liked each other and we did some hanging out after work so it was a good a really good work situation, and Lloyd was cool. Was a cool guy. The ladies loved him. <laughs> he was handsome. Oh, very handsome. Uh, yeah. Now, did you guys uh, date in real life or no? No. No. Okay. All right. Yeah. No, because I mean, you guys were so, you know, on screen. There was such chemistry there, which I think is part of the show's success. Um, yeah. You know, some might say, well, you know, that's not allowed. Believe me, uh, I've heard stories about relationships both at the college level and high school level, uh, even things uh, that even I'll go even one farther in between teachers and um, students meaning and more at the college level where they are of age and you know, I'm saying that you mm -hmm. know sometimes people oh well you know if they knew what had gone on back then believe me they would they would say oh well what's going on now and I don't mean like a 13 year old and their teacher I'm talking uh, you know sure. male female of age which is more at the uh, college level but yeah no you guys right. just had a chemistry that really was uh, unmatched and uh, it's unfortunate that you guys I assume uh, didn't work together afterwards uh, uh, to uh, no. create create some other other characters, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I remember. Um was it? Am I pronouncing the gentleman's name? Was it Heshmu? Was that one of the uh, young students? Heshmu. On the, yeah, Heshmu. I love that. As as himself, I always thought that was yeah. very, <laughs> very clever. And I know that you got uh, back together uh, about five or six years ago at some uh, um, uh, TV event uh, with some of your yeah. castmates, and uh, uh, even even I was uh, I had forgotten, you know. But then it flashed back. Gene Reynolds was was a part of your production team on that show. He was the exact producer. He yeah, was before, before uh, MASH he came hired, along. Yeah. 
-hmm. Yeah, amazing, amazing. So uh, he, he was the one, okay, when I was in New York, I was in the Negro Ensemble Company on stage, so I got a, I, um, uh, I was doing a play, we were doing, uh, we were doing Song of the Lusitania Bogey, and a bad night, one night at the theater, I, some agents came backstage and they were behind me, and I said, okay, I didn't have an agent, so I got an agent, and then soon after that, they called me to come in and read for Room 222, which I did, but there were many, many people that read that part all over the country. <clears throat> so I did that, and they liked the reading, so then they sent me, they brought me out to California to do a screen test, and that was Gene Reynolds, that's when I met Gene. And then I went back to New York, and they called me to come back out to a personality test, and Gene Reynolds directed my personality test. So. You just basically stand in front of the camera and the director is sitting, kind of sitting on the camera and he asks you some questions about your life and you just start talking and kind of sell yourself. So I did that and I had them cracking up talking about being chased by the Ku Klux Klan in Mississippi, which really wasn't <laughs> funny, but I okay, made it funny. Yes. I don't know how. <laughs> yes, ner nervous laughter on this end, my dear. Okay, <laughs> I'm not la I'm not laughing and uh, like ha ha. It's like wow, that, that's right. That's pretty. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Oh but my goodness. Talked, talked, talked about sleeping on the floor because the windows are being shot into, all kind of stuff. But wow. I coded it in this comedic um, take, and so I got the part. <laughs> so. It just seemed to me that the uh, the audition process seemed to be rather lengthy. You know, I mean, uh, maybe uh, I you know I just thought that in the old days, even then, it was just oh, we see somebody, we like them. Yeah, they're a fresh face. Okay, bring them on, do a, a quick test, and then it seemed like you were jockeying back and forth from New York to California for a lot of yeah. a lot of time yeah. to uh, to you know I, I I don't understand the hesitation because uh, certainly um, looking at you back in those days, I mean, it would have been like hey, sign her up. Right right now and and I would say too a lot of that too was on the heels of uh, another trailblazer was uh, 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 Diane Carroll was doing Julia a sitcom at mm -hmm. that point again like another comedy drama where she played a yeah. nurse and and in many ways yeah she you know she was she was a big trailblazer for that because room 222 came on the heels of that show yeah that's true yeah and well, they both they both were shot at 20th Century Fox oh okay mm -hmm. there you go there you go <laughs> I'm looking at a, a shot here of uh, the lovely Denise Nicholas here, uh, and she'll help me out here because I don't remember seeing this movie uh, with uh, the the uh, the diva herself, Aretha Franklin. Tell me, uh, what what film was that from? That's Room 222. Oh, it is. She was on there. Uh, oh, it must, guess. must have been a week where I didn't do my homework and I was being punished. I don't remember that. My goodness. Yeah, and I, you know what? I'd have to go back and dig it up because I cannot. The story. I have no clue what the story was. <laughs> well, I got a kick. Denise was telling me in, uh, before we, we went to tape that uh, she watches the show uh, almost religiously. Uh, I guess it airs out there on the uh, uh, West Coast. She's uh, speaking to us from uh, the Los Angeles area. So that, that's pretty nice. Some people sometimes don't want to look at themselves in the past, but uh, I'm sure you get a kick out of seeing those, uh, those older episodes and uh, saying, oh my goodness, I, I remember, I don't remember. Remember that, yeah. I get a kick out of seeing how skinny I was. <laughs> I'm like, how did I do that? How did I do that? How did I? Oh my goodness! Now I'm sure I'm sure you've kept your fighting weight over the years. Believe me, so that's that's fighting great. weight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could sit on somebody. Oh my goodness! Okay. No, I'm, no, no. I'm exaggerating. I'm exaggerating. I, I'm sure you are. I'm sure you are. Denise <laughs> Nicholas, uh, exaggerator plus, but not not when it comes to her acting and her her book. Uh, joining us here. For the hour on uh, Studio 411. Uh, the book, of course, A Freshwater Road. I'm going to read another uh, quote uh, about how terrific the book is. What a wonderful surprise Denise Nicholas's first novel is. Her textured characters unfold against the backdrop of an historic encounter that was destined to change America forever. Uh, the, uh, the great actor Sidney Poitier. Uh, and of course, many people think Sidney was born in this country. Correct me if I'm wrong. He was born on one of the islands, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. That's right. So people always think that uh, he was uh, uh, born here in North America, but he was not. Uh, now tell me, um, I heard you say this on another show, and I remember thinking to myself, boy, if I ever meet her, I've got to like help her clarify this. One of your first TV roles was on a great show that didn't didn't get the credit it deserved. It was called NYPD. Correct. 
Mm -hmm. That was with yes. your friend Robert Hooks. And at the time, I remember you saying you couldn't remember who some of the other actors were. The two that come to mind was Frank Converse. And Jack Warden. And Ward. Jack Warden, correct, yeah. yeah yes. that's a, but at the time I said, oh, and I remember that. Because, you know, it was kind of like a forerunner of, uh, in my mind, of the uh, two decades or three decades later, NYPD Blue was kind of Blue, that exactly. show. And it was almost yes. like Naked City. You know, it was always the, those those shows set in New York, and I believe they did film in New York, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, it just, you know, good stuff. But uh, it might have been a little ahead of its time. I don't know why it didn't last as long. Another episode that really put you out in the forefront, which uh, uh, I remember the show very well, was uh, It Takes a Thief uh, with Robert Wagner. That must have been yes. a, an experience. And uh, who was his sidekick uh -oh. on the show? Didn't he have um, uh, he had he had a co-star on that show? Um, on It Takes a Thief. Yeah, yeah, and I'm blanking on who. I that don't was. have a clue. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now I know you've told me off air you you want to work on or have been working on your memoir. So again, this is where you've got a you, you can call me for any any uh, actors and actresses because I'll help you fill in the gaps because you've got just Hell you know yeah. a great story to tell, no doubt. Not just you know the first twenty years of your life, but then your and as I, I think I told you, you almost have to split it into like kind of like a Hollywood memoir because there's so much to talk about. We know mm -hmm. there's been, you know, some some tragedy in your life with your your uh, sister that was uh, murdered uh, uh, several years ago. But you know, what I'm saying with yes. the, the uh, folks, they they eat up that Hollywood stuff, you know, then uh, yeah. ha stage, screen, and television. So you've got you've got a, a just a, a wealth of co-stars to uh, to talk about for sure. Um, after Room 222 ended, then of course you started doing again more films. I wanted to ask, as I don't have an image of it here, I don't think, but you did a movie with Dean Martin and a very young, my goodness, it was scary how young he was, Philip Michael Thomas, who probably a decade later went on to star in uh, Miami Vice. Miami Vice. Uh, tell, me, tell me a little bit about that movie and what it was like, uh, Dean Martin, at that kind of like tail end of his film career. Yeah, it was, I mean, okay, I don't have a whole a whole lot in my memory bank about that project. We shot in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. and Philip Michael Thomas played my younger brother. Uh, he was the one getting in some kind of trouble. Dean Martin was a cop. Uh, I have only feelings about it. It was, it all felt right, but I think the script was a little soft. I don't think it, you know, it didn't get any real play. But it was fun to work with him and to get to know him and Philip Michael Thomas as well. But Dean Martin, of course, was like super, super duper. So I was like, oh, my now, God. Now, in those days, Dean was uh, still doing his uh, his roast shows. I, I think his variety series had just about yeah. ended. Yeah. But, I mean, was he still, because uh, the way they say he would be would be, uh, you know, he would shoot his, his scenes and then, oh, where's Dean? Oh, he's off playing golf somewhere. Was he, like, still <laughs> like that in those days? <laughs> He was resting. He was resting. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it was uh, was apple juice in those drinks. I'm told. I'm yeah. always told it was apple, apple juice. Apple. It was yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although when he'd go on Carson, boy, I tell you, their their eyes would roll back in their heads when they took a sip of that apple juice. So you know. He but. was he was <laughs> awfully nice. He was really really nice, uh, really gracious and kind. You know, I think that generation. I guess it would be like meeting, in a sense, like meeting Tony Bennett or Frank Sinatra, people of that ilk. They're just, they just had a kind of a suave way of being in the world. They were elegant, they were sophisticated, but they could get down. Sure. Oh yeah. Wonderful. Oh yeah. yeah. Now, Philip Michael Thomas. Did you ever run into him years later after his success uh, on Miami Vice? Did you ever like, hey, I remember you played my little brother? <laughs> <laughs> no, I wish. I wish. Because he again, he went into the stratosphere with Miami Vice, and then he disappeared. Yeah, it kind of uh, you know it was uh, four or five years, and then uh, I, I have not have not heard or seen anything from him uh, since then. But I was just amazed that this was like circa 1975 when uh, uh, what was it called, Mr. Rico, I believe was the name of that movie. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember seeing the promo for, it, and I thought, oh, this is kind of a you know interesting movie. They were taking a lot of the Hollywood you know stars of of yesteryear, or even at that point but I'm saying maybe not quite as 
busy as they once were and kind of setting these kind of urban dramas, you know, kind of set, mm -hmm. you know, playing a cop, you know, John Wayne did the same thing, Kirk Douglas. It was kind of like trying to uh, ingrain them in with what was happening in the inner city, you know, to a degree and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, no, but, that's it, true. but it was a good, a good experience. Now tell me, um, uh, you were fortunate again over a period of years, but we'll stick with the mid '70s. Uh, you hooked up with uh, quite a quite a cast of characters: uh, Mr. Uh, Jimmy Walker for one, Mr. Sidney Poitier, who we alluded to uh, earlier, as well as Bill Cosby in a uh, mm -hmm. a couple of films that were. Um, uh, again, I'll let you tell. They uh, they were kind of like uh, urban comedies. Would we would we agree there? Yes. Yes, they were fun. Uh, there was, you know, I, I have a tendency to be attracted to serious. Okay, I have to. I'm sorry, that's not true. I love comedy. I love comedy. But I also love substantial or sub substance, substantive material. Right. And these were really just fun. These were fun. And I, I think when I look back on my whole career, the most fun I ever had at any acting job on the comedy side was in Let's Do It Again. Wow. With uh, Cosby and Sydney and Jimmy Walker and that whole crew, because it just allowed me to really show off my comedic skills. So I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Now, you did that one. You did also with uh, uh, Mr. Cosby and Mr. Portier. You did Piece of the, the Action, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, and now those movies, do you remember, uh, did Sydney direct either one or both of those, or was it a, a, just another director that did those? Oh, no, he directed Let's Do It Again. He did, okay. Uh, and then when you did Ghost Dad in the early 90s with Cosby, then uh, Sydney, he directed yeah, that. Directed yeah, directed that yeah. as well. There you go. Mm -hmm. And now I'm told that was because I didn't see the movie again. I might have seen previews of it. That was kind of a uh, an updated Derby. version of The Invisible Derby. Man. <laughs> Yes, it was a turkey. It was a, an invisible turkey. There you go. Yes. <laughs> oh, Denise. It was not very good. Denise pulls no punches, I'm telling you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, again. Now, we've got a great shot of you here talk about doing comedy. Uh, and I never mm -hmm. understood why this show didn't uh, make it uh, bigger than, I guess, the year and a half it was on. Uh, mm -hmm. You were on a show with uh, uh, Damon Wilson. Uh, of course, uh, who uh, was best known for Sanford and Son, and I guess after he left that show, they decided, oh, we got to get him on another show. Uh, Baby, I'm back. And again, that uh, w what was that like? Ridiculous. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm saying uh, I'm, I'm sensing not necessarily in a good way. So was it because I, I, you know, you had a good cast of people, many of whom went on to do other things, but uh, you, and some big things. But yeah. I think it was it was uh, there wasn't anything wrong with the concept. You know, uh, a man and a woman break up. They live in Washington D.C. She's working in the government. She's doing reasonably well. They have two kids, and her mother. Uh, stays with them in their apartment in D.C., and he wants back into their life is there because he's the husband, he's the father, and they have, you know, so the whole thing is about him trying to get back and her not letting him back in. So that was fine, and I, again, it gave me an opportunity to do some light comedy, which I loved, uh, but there was so much strife on the show. <laughs> it was like just week after week of agony in terms of the politics and all the stuff that was going on behind the scenes. So when the show was canceled, <laughs> I was so tired. I, I think I left the studio, went home, packed a suitcase, boarded a flight to Spain. And I <laughs> <laughs> wow. International escape. My goodness. It, it was like, get me out of here now. So oh, wow. I have to ask, too, because uh, you said you weren't necessarily... Um, envisioning yourself as becoming an actress, but give me a couple of people uh, during even those first uh, 10 or 15 years, uh, people that uh, will we'll stick with women, not necessarily uh, uh, any particular ethnicity, but uh, women that you kind of looked up to or said, wow, I really would like to emulate her or be more or I admire her. Give me a, a two or three people. You didn't necessarily have to have worked with them, but uh, either, either or that you worked with or that you wished you had worked with who were influential in what you were as an actress in those days. Well, I, I, like, I used to love to look at old movies, so there was a, a classic movie channel here before TCM, 
and I think it was on Channel 9, I'm not, I'm not really sure, but I used to watch a lot of old films, and uh, Betty Davis was always my favorite act on the dramatic side. And in terms of how they looked on screen and what kind of power they had, in terms of look, it was Ava Gardner, period. Wow. Um, in fact, I was looking at last night, and the Barefoot Contestant was on with Humphrey Bogart and Dick Clark. And I thought, my God, this one was so, so beautiful. And, and I think that sometimes people kind of didn't take her whole, her whole presence into account because they couldn't get past her physical beauty. But she was not a great actress, but she was good. She was good enough. And uh, the, after that, they had Bawani Junction on. Which started, uh, she was just really gorgeous. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, she she definitely had a presence, but again, sometimes Hollywood uh, couldn't get, as you said, couldn't get past certain things, good or bad. In this yeah. case, her beauty, yeah. which you know, Sinatra certainly saw the beauty <laughs> for sure. You know, amongst others, I, I I can't. Oh well, she was married to Mickey Rooney too. Yeah, he was like yeah, the. He was, he, like the Mike, yeah, he was like the Michael J. Fox of, uh, of uh, actors, although, you know, I'm not implying Michael pretty much married one woman and has stayed married all along, but, yeah, right. but, but right. in terms of that kind of popularity, uh, same stature, whatever, but yeah, Mickey, uh, my goodness, uh, he, had, he had quite a career, but uh, how about folks that you uh, had an opportunity to work with? Uh, I know there was something I read about uh, a lovely actress, and I'm just blanking on her name. She was the um, mother to Sidney Poitier and uh, guess who's coming to dinner? I know that you had some dealings with her, I believe. Oh, B. Richards. B. Richards, yeah. What a lovely, yeah, lovely woman. She was, she was terrific. Oh, yeah. yeah. I never worked with her, I don't think. But I did know her, yeah. and I did uh, have a great, great deal of respect for her. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, in that case, now then we, we go through the 80s, and uh, you're appearing here, there, and everywhere. I mean, there are, at times I, I look at your, your uh, resume, and I'm like, I, I don't remember this appearance or that appearance. But again, <laughs> at that point where you, you hadn't begun really in your head writing, uh, or if you were, you certainly weren't releasing it to the public. But And, and also, too, mm -hmm. let me clarify, because something I found out, this is your first book of fiction. However, you mm -hmm. were part of a book that has your name credited. It was a, like, kind of a, a beauty modeling book that came out in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. a beauty book for teenagers. That was... Uh, that was during my room 22 time. So it was, and I, you know, I did, we did, we all did so much promotion all over the country. I and mean, we, oh my God, we did city a day tours year in and year out. Um, and I kept meeting, you know, high school kids, girls, junior high and high school girls at all these promotional events. And uh, it became apparent to me that there was, there was something missing and some of their upbringing in terms of how to take care of yourself. So, and I didn't want to do something that would cost people a lot of money. So I was busy trying to find formulas and products that were affordable or even things that you could make at home that girls could do on their own, in the, like in high school. So that's what the book was about. There you go. Actress Denise Nicholas, author, uh, activist, joining us for the remaining time here on Studio 411. Uh, Newsday Magazine said about her book, Freshwater Road, breathtaking, perhaps the best work of fiction ever done about the civil rights movement. Uh, Freshwater Rose, um, Agate Publishing. For more information, uh, Denise's website, www.denisenicholas.net, if I have that correct. Um, now, uh, one thing, and, and she said you know it's okay to talk about it because frankly some of this information I was totally uh, shocked about um, you were married at one point to uh, uh, rock and roll Hall of Famer Bill Withers uh, short yes. short marriage and uh, uh, again uh, not gonna ask too much about that but I just in the concept of you were you have been married three times uh, Jim mm -hmm. Hill uh, uh, NFL uh, veterans uh, longtime sportscaster I understand still is uh, active in sports out there locally in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes. Fill me in a little bit on, on your first marriage. It was someone that during your theatrical days uh, who was uh, passed away a few well, years ago. Yeah, he passed away. He had cancer. Yeah. Um, his name was Gilbert Moses, and he was one of the founders of the Free Southern Theater. Uh, he was brilliant, a uh, theater person and a writer, and I think the, the 
the little kernel, the little seed was planted about writing in that relationship with him because he so uh, admired writing, and he was a good writer. So he had worked at, uh, in France at the Theater National Populaire with Jean Villard, and it was a concept of creating a theater uh, that you take to the people, a touring theater. And so that's why, that's where the idea for the Free Southern Theater actually came from. It came from Gil Moses' experience in France. <clears throat> and he had been active at Caramu House in Cleveland. That's where he was from. So um, it was short. It was uh, a very, a relationship really based on creativity, writing, and the arts and theater. I don't know that it was... Uh, it wasn't a companionship. It was more like a guru to student. Gotcha. You know, it's not that our age difference was so great. It's just that he was so advanced. He was so in, incredibly smart. So I was attracted to that, as I am to this day, attracted to smart. So, um, so now I, 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 I kind of look at you as kind of almost like the glorious time of, of today. You, you have gone many years without, uh, at this point, you know, being uh, in a married relationship. Or am I to assume that at this point uh, that is not in the foreseeable future? No. <laughs> okay. So even if I try to set you up, no, no, no doubt about it. No, you'd have to be very rich and you'd have to be in the arts or something. <laughs> That's right. My dad said, <laughs> what did he say? He said, oh, he said many things, but one of the things he said is, don't stay too long at the fair. <laughs> well, I was going to say, yeah, the, you only stayed about an average of a year and a half. I read that on, on one, um, we'll call it a critique. And again, I, you know, and, and they said, yeah. And I said, wow, they're not kidding. I said, I got 18 years out of my first. Uh, you average about a year and a half. But anyway, that uh, stuff happens. Uh -oh. You know, <laughs> stuff happens. But yeah, no, and because I had no. seen that you were actually on an episode oh. of Soul Train one time, and I'm like, well, that's great. But why would Don Cornelius have her unless she sang? And then I said, oh, that's because she was, you know, you were involved with Bill Withers. And and then I thought, oh, that's why. And then of course, uh, Mr. Hill later on in the 80s, and then after that, mm -hmm. you've been free as a bird for uh, for quite a few years. Yeah, I like it like this. Well, I was going to say, don't you find that at this point, uh, we're, we're talking o well over two decades, uh, that, you know, it's almost, mm -hmm. uh, you might find it hard to, to share share the uh, the towels with someone else. And the, I, I know from experience. I know from experience. It's happened. It's yeah. happened to me. But no, but that's you know, good. I think, I think that, I think that, well, you know, if you're at, if you want to have children, I think you should be married. I think. But if you're not going to have children, and I made a decision to not have children, which I periodically regret, but it's too late for that, um, I'm not sure what, what is marriage. So a companion or a, a person that you care deeply about doesn't require the state. It doesn't require a, a court. It's to me, a good relationship is a good relationship with or without marriage, put it that way. Right, right. So, Sort of the Goldie Hawn, Kurt Russell philosophy, I have a feeling. Yeah, <laughs> and a few others we could name. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, but they stand out. Mm -hmm. Now, um, yeah. uh, again, you don't have to answer this, but kind of regale us a little bit, your, your many fans. Uh, uh, in my research, uh, uh, name, name uh, uh, two or three uh, uh, folks that you've dated over the years, perhaps like uh, I had someone recently on who I didn't know had dated George Clooney. So all of a sudden I was like, wow, you know, and then another guest tells me, oh, that she she lived with a well-known actor for many years and didn't know that. So all of a sudden, anyone of note that over the last 20 years that you dated that we, we might know who they are? No. No? Okay. Oh, so she stayed away from the entertainers. <laughs> That's probably a wise decision. I tell you, I, I, I don't like my personal life bandied about in public there you go there you go i tend to be i tend to be a private person i always was and i think that's why the results of those bad marriages just about broke i mean it broke me in a way because not so much because the marriages didn't work although that's, that's painful enough but it, it was on me i made the bad decision so but to have my personal life play you know out there like that i just went oh my lord my oof, i don't like it i don't like it and so the whole thing of what we're dealing with now in this cult of celebrity and cult of personality life that we're now living, I can't bear it. 
Oh yeah, no, I mean, and and I want to know what you did this morning in your heyday. I mean, oh well, but of course, uh, even with Twitter and stuff. I mean, some of it you would agree yeah. that whether it's a website or a Twitter site, some of that is required oh. as part of the the business end of things. But you know, it just uh, it's amazing that people get anything done because you know, and I find myself even falling akin to that. You're you're doing something, and then you find yourself checking the phone. You know, we uh, recently upgraded my sure. phone. I find myself. Uh, worrying about emails that, frankly, I could have looked at after dinner. Now it's 10 o'clock. I have to look at them now because, ooh, I might be missing something. No, it'll still be there when, <laughs> when you get there. It'll still be there, but yeah. that's, how we, that's how we now are, uh, that's how we're living. Yeah. We're living, yeah. I mean, the phone is right by the bed. I check email in the middle of the night. I mean, this is crazy. There you go. You know, you spend time on Facebook. Why? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know. Uh, unless it's Do part, it. unless it's part of something you're doing on a business level, that that I understand. But even then, sometimes you just have to, you know, push it away, and and it's it's hard. It's hard, and and I, and that's for so, someone uh, again in our age bracket. Whereas the younger folks, I mean, that's all they know. I mean, I'm driving exactly. in front of somebody, and then behind me, I see their head down, almost like it's down by the cigarette lighter, and I'm like, well, what is that? Are they are they in <laughs> some sort of peril? Well, no, they're texting, you know. So, but again, I'm not going to be here preaching. We all we all know what I mean by that. So. But it's dangerous. It's dangerous. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, had a, I bought a new car a couple of years ago, and I was driving, and it was a lot of traffic. There's always a lot of traffic here. So, a lady, I stopped. The traffic stopped. I stopped, and the lady behind me bumped into my car, and I, I thought the traffic it, 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 this shouldn't have happened. Sure. So I got out of the car. And she was shaking. I mean, just shaking. And I thought to myself, this lady was texting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There is no reason for her to have hit my car except she wasn't paying attention. So what was she doing? She probably was texting. Yeah, that's right. And she was very upset. I mean, we all, you know, we worked it out. Everything turned out fine. But she was so nervous because if the police had come, they were going to, you know. <laughs> Throw the phone at her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was definitely at fault. Oh, there sure. Was no reason for there was nothing wrong with her break. And that's why the uh, the statistics, uh, uh, as we end uh, on that note, uh, as far as that segment, uh, uh, the uh, you know the statistics bear it out. You know the uh, yeah. the, the national statistics don't want to come out and say it, but when you hear about the different things going on, you know exactly why there's an increase in fatalities. I was recently in New York yeah. City, and you're crossing the street, and they don't even know. You could come and just tap them and knock them right out right on their on their behind, and they wouldn't have an idea because their heads are down and their thumbs. I, I, and I think I told you if I could come back in another life it would have been as a uh, as a uh, uh, an ear doctor an audiologist mm -hmm. or as a thumb doctor I'd make a killing because between their yeah. their things in their ears and their whatever uh, deaf di uh, dumb and crippled I'd make a I'd make a fortune but anyway yes, en enough absolutely. of that enough of my uh, my wishful endeavors in terms of careers uh, as we uh, uh, get down to the end of our uh, wonderful time with Denise uh, in the heat of the night working with Carol O'Connor Carl Weathers mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's where you're writing uh, I guess in part because of uh, Mr. O'Connor uh, urging you to put pen to paper or pen to lap processor, perhaps? Well, you know, it, as far back as Room 22, I was beginning to to write. I, I wasn't sure how to, to do it. I hadn't taken any writing classes at that point. I just always liked to read and I always liked to write. So I did write some uh, story ideas for Room 22, none of which were accepted by Time Passes. I also knew early on that I would eventually write something about the civil rights movement. That was in the back of my head from day one. So <clears throat> by the time we got to In the Heat of the Night, uh, I was writing more and, you know, snippets of things, anecdotes, whatever, whatever. So I went into Carol O'Connor one day and I said, look, I want to write. So uh, I have a couple of story ideas that I'd like to, uh, you know, submit them. And he said, okay. So I told him the story. One of the, the first story that I did for him was a kind of a piece off of the Civil Rights Movement. I said, why don't we do, I said, you're doing a story about Mississippi. The series takes place in Mississippi. You have never mentioned the Civil Rights Movement in this show. And I know that's not, you know, America doesn't want to hear about it. But I said, it happened. It happened. And it happened big in Mississippi. So why do we do a story about the first black lady who tries to register to vote in the town of Sparta? And he said, I'll buy it. <laughs> there you go. At which point, 
I fainted. And then I said, oh, okay, so um, who's going to write it? And he said, you are. And I said, I am? He said, you are, and I'm going to help you. And that's where it started. That's great, I'll tell you. Yeah, that's, it uh, was. And, and uh, we just saw an image of you there as, as we wind down the episode, uh, for now anyway, but uh, that must have caused, uh, caused quite an upheaval, more so than even I realized, when uh, the two characters uh, during the last season or two of the series uh, got married. I'm sure there was uh, quite a bit of, even in the 90s, quite a bit of... Uh, uh, hate mail. Ma yes, I was, trying to, I was trying to be delicate, male perhaps. I know, yeah. I know. <laughs> but, to be continued, my dear, we appreciate you joining us uh, here for this hour. The book, again, Freshwater Road, published by Agate Publishing. Um, again, just a wonderful, uh, wonderful work, and uh, again, uh, just a wonderful career you've had. We've only scratched the surface. We look forward to having you back on with us, Denise. Uh, uh, and again, I, I can't thank you enough for making time in your busy schedule to join us. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. you hang there with us, and uh, we thank you for joining us here on this episode of Studio 411. Larry DeSilva here with you. We look forward to seeing you again next time. Take care.